is time now to talk about independence, which may be the one of the most important ideas in probability theory. One of the things that makes probability theory uh, genuinely interesting. In fact, I would almost go so far to say that it's very hard to find a probability model that isn't somewhere using the idea of independence. You can almost find it anywhere if you look hard enough. So independence is an extremely important idea in probability. I've heard some people say that independence is what keeps probability as a mathematical theory from just being a subset of analysis. So we're going to talk about uh, independence if you come away from this lecture not or come away from this class maybe more appropriately uh not knowing what independence is then that's that's bad that's really bad you must understand independence because it is used everywhere it's one of the most important ideas in probability theory so two events a and b are said to be independent if the probability of a given b is the probability of a so in some sense, the information about the event B gives no information about whether A has happened since uh, the probability of A knowing that B happened does not change. Uh, so first off, I've said only that the probability of A given B is the probability of A. Uh, uh, what about the probability of B given A? And before I proceed, I should probably uh, make a quick note saying I'm going to assume that a and B are events that have probabilities on their own that are not necessarily zero, just because uh, it's easier mathematically to assume that their probabilities are not zero. And you kind of have to uh, treat the case where they are events with probability zero as a little, as a, as a, a separate thing. But honestly, for, for the most part, you get the information that you need with, with just pretending that just ignoring the, the chance that, uh, they have probability zero. Okay, so. Uh, all right, then. Let's uh, compute the probability of B given A. Uh, it seems like what should be the case is that if A is independent of B, then B should be independent of A as well. And in fact, that turns out to be the case because we compute the probability of B given A, and that's going to be the probability of a and b divided by the probability of a and we then say that the numerator is equal to the probability of a given b uh, times the probability of b uh, divided by the probability of a by the way uh, if you're not recognizing this part uh, recalling back to the previous lecture this is a Bayes theorem prototype Ugh, that, that, all right, that's some bad, bad handwriting up there. I cannot, I cannot let that go. I know that in some of these videos, my handwriting isn't great, but I cannot let that go. So this is a Bayes theorem prototype in that you're pretty much one step away from getting Bayes uh, theorem. All you would need to do at this point is apply uh, the law of total probability to the denominator uh, down here in order to get Bayes theorem. But anyway, that aside, all right, that was a, a distraction. Um, we now say that this is the probability of A given B times the probability of B uh, divided by the probability of A, but we now know that the probability of A given B, because A is independent of B, that's going to be the probability of A. So this is the probability of A times the probability of B uh, divided by the probability of B, you can uh, probability of A, sorry, and you can probably see why we're assuming that these events don't have zero probability because we could end up with division by zero. So uh, we're going to cancel those out because they appear in the numerator and the denominator, and we get the probability of B in the end. Okay, all right. So that shows what we wanted to wanted to show. So um, this implies that. If a is uh, in, if a is independent of b, uh, so if a is independent of b, uh, that that's going to imply that b is independent of a, and vice versa. All right. Uh, it seems that 
it, it would seem to be the case that if A is independent of B, and so um, heuristically, that knowing whether B happened gives you no information about whether A happened, it should also be the true for the complement of A if you, if, um, so knowing that B happened should not tell you whether A didn't happen either. So uh, this does in fact turn out to be the case because we compute the probability of A complement given B and that's going to be the probability of A complement given B. Uh, we know from uh, the previous section, this is one minus the probability of A given B and the probability of A given B is going to be the probability of a so this is one minus the probability of a which we know from section two is equal to the probability of a complement so that means that the complement of a is also independent of b so there is an immediate consequence of this definition which is that the probability of a intersected with b is equal to the probability of A times the probability of B. You can see that because you could uh, potentially say that, uh, uh, like you would start out before saying the probability of A, that this is the probability of A given B. But since A is independent of B, that's just going to be the probability of A. So that means that the probability of intersections turns into the product of probabilities. And not only is this a consequence of how I've defined the definition. Ooh, I misspelled definition. <laughs> uh, not only is this a consequence of how I uh, defined independence, uh, independence of events. Uh, this is actually taken in later courses and higher level probability courses or, or courses devoted to probability as the definition of independence. Because the two are, are essentially equivalent. And furthermore, uh, what I've highlighted in blue here, it's used even more frequently. And, uh, and, and also, uh, it, it, it's, uh, you, you have this issue of zero probability events. And we don't have that issue here because there's no division taking place. Okay. Okay. Uh, Students often want to, like I've been encouraging students to think about uh, probabilities and 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 uh, sets and events in terms of Venn diagrams. And uh, is it possible to get a Venn diagram uh, graphically representing independence? It is, although it's kind of hard and honestly not that enlightening i'm going to show it to you anyway though first off this is not what independence is this is not a picture of independence we have a we have b and we have our sample space that is not independence this is disjointedness and two events that are disjoint and uh, have non-zero probability are certainly not independent of each other because if you knew that one event one of those two events happened you know that the other one didn't so disjointedness is not the same thing. In fact, it's almost the opposite thing uh, or uh, uh, implies non-independence. So disjointedness is not independence. It's almost the opposite. Okay, so uh, I'm promising you to make a, uh, to show what independence kind of looks like as a Venn diagram. I can kind of torture a Venn diagram. So what I do is, um, I'm going to need to zoom in a lot for this. Uh, so to attempt to draw uh, two sets that are independent of each other, I uh, t draw the sample space as a square. I divide it up into fourths. And then I'm going to give the set A the upper left corner, nothing special about that particular corner. It just needs to be a corner. And then I give the event B the middle quadrant. It should be the same area roughly as A. It's just taking up the middle area. And uh, the area inside of A is 
uh, and B relative to B is same is the same as A's area relative to the entire sample space. So, or or that is, uh, A is take A's area is a quarter of the sample space, and A's area in B or A's intersection in B is a is um, a quarter of B. So knowing that you fell into that, so basically A corresponds to the probability of falling into the upper left-hand corner uh, quadrant, and knowing that you are in this middle square does not really tell you whether you fell into that quadrant or not. Um, that gives you basically no information on that. So this is a sketch of what independent events might look like if you want to draw them as a Venn diagram. If this sketch does not make sense to you, then don't worry about it. Just leave it alone uh, because... You know, it's it's very much a tortured example. You have to kind of work hard to get something that looks like this. And I'm not super convinced that it's necessarily all that enlightening as to what independence means. So if it doesn't make sense to you, then just move on. Don't worry about it. Um, okay, uh, so the next example, we're going to consider rolling a six-sided die. And I'm going to show that the event A, which is that the number uh, of pips does not exceed four, and the event B, that the number of pips is even, are independent events. So let's uh, go ahead and uh, enumerate what falls into uh, these two uh, separate events. We have the event A, well not separate, just different. Uh, so the uh, event A, uh, the number does not exceed four. So that includes uh, one pip, two pips, three pips, and four pips. All right, uh, the event B, which is that you get an even number of pips is going to be two pips, four pips. Ugh. Come on, I want the fourth pip. Ugh. I tried, and six pips. Ugh. Not always cooperative. All right. Um, so let's compute the probability of A given B. To show that two events are independent, it is sufficient to just compute the probability of A given B and show that that equals the probability of A. So the probability of A given B is going to be the probability of A and B uh, divided by the probability of B. All of these outcomes are equally likely. So uh, the intersection of the two sets is going to consist of two and four. Those are the two things the two sets have in common. So this is going to be uh, the dice with face two and the dice with face four. Ugh. Why is it so uncooperative? <laughs> Okay, there we go. Uh, probably two, probably four, and um, divided by uh, the probability of B. Okay, and at this point we can basically just count how many elements are in these sets. So uh, for the intersection, there's two outcomes in that set. Uh, and uh, for the probability of B, there's three, so that's gonna be three over six. So we end up with uh, the sixes canceling out and the probability of A given B is equal to two thirds as a result. But the probability of A, there are four outcomes in A uh, divided by uh, the size of the sample space, which is six, which is also two thirds. Those two numbers are the same. Therefore, these two events are uh, independent of each other. Okay, uh, next up, we su suppose we have events A1 through AN. These sets are said to be mutually e independent if, and I know that this definition is rather complicated. For K less than or equal to N, the probability of any subset of that collection of events will become the product of their individual probabilities. So it is not sufficient to just check that for all of these events, A1 through AN, uh, the probability of the intersection is the probability of probabilities. It has to be true for not just the entire collection of events, but any sub-collection of that collection of events. It, they all must uh, 
turn into product of probabilities. If this is not true, then they are not said to be mutually independent of each other. Um, and here's kind of the reason why. Um, when we were saying mutually independent, it what we really kind of want to say is that uh, none of these events give any information about any of the other events. And so that means that you would want to say that you take any two events in this collection of events and they will be independent of each other. You want to be able to say that, but it is not sufficient to just check that the entire intersection, the probability of the entire intersection turns into the product of the respective probabilities. And here is an example that shows uh, why that is not in fact true. Um, so uh, this is an example from uh, from uh, actually uh, this paper that I've highlighted in red. Um, use the diagram below for finding probabilities, compute the probability of A and B and C. That actually is just going to be uh, that tiny little uh, sliver. So probably of A and B and C is equal to 0.04. And then we're going to find the product of the, of the probabilities of the events A, B, excuse me, and C. Uh, so the probability of A, so that's going to be the probability of the blue circle, which is going to be uh, 0.1 plus 0.06 plus 0.04, which is 0.2. So this will be 0.2. The probability of B is going to be the green circle. So that's going to be 0.06 plus 0.04, that's 0.1, plus another 0.1 is 0.2, plus another 0.2 is 0.4. So this will be 0.4. And uh, finally, we've got the probability of C, which is going to be this uh, blue circle here. So we've got uh, 0.16 plus 0.04 is 0.2, plus another 0.2 is 0.4, plus 0.1 will be 0.5. So uh, this probability, the probability of C, is equal to 0.5. So uh, the probability of A times the probability of B times the probability of C is going to be uh, 0.2 times 0.5, which is 0.1, times 0.4, which will be 0.04. And those two numbers are equal to each other. So it's tempting to say uh, that these events are independent of each other. But then I ask you to compute the probability of A uh, intersected with B. So the probability of A intersected with B corresponds to this blue region that I've highlighted, which is going to be 0.1. So that equals 0.1, but that does not equal the probability of A times the probability of B, which is equal to 0.08. And, you might, and before you say, well, those numbers are close, close doesn't mean a thing. I don't care about close. They need to be the same. So, uh, yeah, they are, they are not independent events. And as a result, these events, A, B, and C, are uh, not mutually independent. Could you say that there is some other notion of independence that you can apply? I don't really know, and I don't really care, because I have seen notions maybe like pairwise independence uh, as an alternative notion of independence, and I've never seen it ever used in my own life or work it doesn't really seem like it leads to any sort of useful uh useful concepts so yeah that's uh, that's that's that all right uh next example This example is supposed to motivate, uh, maybe you remember when I was uh, talking about flipping a coin to you get heads, this example is supposed to motivate uh, our assignment of probabilities in that situation. So we're going to flip, uh, remove the eight part that, I don't know why that was there. I don't know why I have uh, 
eight fair coins. So flip fair coins until we get heads. And furthermore, each flip is independent. Okay, so what is the probability of heads? Tails heads, tails, tails heads, tails, tails, tails heads. Uh, what in general, what will be the probability of a sequence of flips, a, a, a sequence of n flips to have n minus one tails and a heads at the end? So the probability of heads, if this is a fair coin, is going to be uh, one half. Uh, the probability of tails heads, and this is by the way getting a little abusive with notation, but the but the probability of tails heads. It's going to be the probability of tails times the probability of heads since those two flips were independent of each other, which will be one half times one half, which is one fourth, which equals one half squared. Okay, the probability of tails, tails, heads will be the probability of tails, the probability of tails the probability of heads because these things are all independent of each other, which will be uh, one half to the power of three. And you can see now where this is going. I'm not even gonna bother with the, with the three tails, one head situation. We're just gonna jump right to the end of this. If we've got, if we're asking for the probability of n tails, or n minus one tails, my apologies, and a final head, so there are n minus one tails here, and a final head, uh, so there's one head. That's going to be uh, the product of tails, uh, of the probability of tails, sorry. And then we've got the probability of tails, and this appears uh, n minus one times. And then you got the probability of heads at the very end. And each one, everything here actually, all of those probabilities are gonna be one half. And you are able to break it up into a product like this because of independence. So we then compute this. There are going to, so basically you have one half being multiplied n times. So this is one half to the power n, which is corresponding with the probability assignment that I used in the section where I was working with flipping coins until I got ahead. Uh, because implicitly those flips were assumed to be independent of each other. Okay, uh, next example. Uh, below is a system of components. A signal will be sent from one end of the system and will be successfully transmitted to the other end if no intermediate components fail. Each component functions independently of the others. What is the probability a transmission is sent successfully? So I did not draw out uh, the components in the lecture notes because I'm going to draw them right now. So uh, here is their configuration. Uh, we have uh, an upper row and a lower row. Uh, we've got three components in the lower row and two in the upper row. Okay, and uh, we're going to say that the event A1 corresponds to this blue component working the event A2 corresponds to this green component working, and we have the events B1, B2, B3, which are corresponding to each of those respective lower row components working. And then inside of this diagram, we will uh, write down the probability that that individual component works. And importantly, we are assuming that all of these uh, all of these uh, components function independently of the others, which means that all of these events, A1, A2, B1, B2, B3, are mutually independent events. So let's now describe the transmission event. Transmission occurs if, a, if the signal is able to find uh, a path from one end of the system to the other. So we could have potentially the blue path where it goes through the upper row, 
or we could have the red path where it travels through the lower row if either so in other words if either of those rows consist completely of functioning components and none of the components have failed then we have transmission so that means that the event corresponding to transmission is going to be the event where a1 and a2 work or b1 and b2 and b3 work okay um so then we need to compute the probability of transmission and the probability of transmission will be the probability of uh, A1 and A2 or B1 and B2 and B3. And now we should probably treat A1 and A2 as being a unit and B1, B2, B3 as a unit. So maybe uh, call A1 and A2 together their intersection A and the intersection of B1, B2, B3, B. Uh, we could probably compute yeah, yeah. Let's uh, let's let's say that this then is the probability of of A, which is the uh, upper row is functioning, and the probability of intersected with B that the lower row is functioning. And let's compute the probability of A and the probability of B. So the probability of A, we now get to say because of independence that this is equal to 0.8 times 0.9 which is the probability of A, A1 times the probability of A2, which is going to be uh, 0.72. The probability of B, because of mutual independence, is going to be the probability of B1 times the probability of B2 times the probability of B3, which is going to be uh, 0.7 times 0.8 times 0.9. So 0.7 times 0.8 times 0.9 which equals, um, which uh, is equal to uh, 0.504. And we also know, because all of these events are mutually independent of each other, that A and B are, so the events A and B, those events also are independent of each other because they can, are basically the, uh, the result of forming uh, of uh, so they are formed using events that are mutually independent of each other so that means for the probability of a and no not the probability of a and b i'm sorry this is a typo down here uh this is the probability of a or b so the probability of a or b you know from one of the formulas that we came up with in section two and this is going to be the probability of a plus the probability of b uh minus the probability of A and B, but we know what the probability of A and B is since A and B are independent of each other. So we're going to end up with um, this being equal to 0.72 plus 0.504 minus 0.72 times 0.504, which is equal to uh, I computed this out, uh, 0.86112. So that is going to be the probability of transmission. And you can probably see already why prob why intersection is such, in uh, no, not intersection, uh, why independence is such an important concept. Because if we didn't have independence of these components, we would be forced to specify the probability of every single intersection that we uh, ever encountered here. Every single intersection must have an assigned probability, and that is going to be an enormous amount of probabilities that we need to write down. So it's an incredibly simplifying assumption to say that things are independent of each other. Okay, uh, I love examples like this. You want to know why I love examples like this? Because I remember taking this very class and not understanding it.
So now that I have um, gone much further in my academic career um, uh, and uh, now can understand these uh, system type problems, I can now throw them to my students and watch them struggle just like I struggled. Okay. Uh, all right. So uh, next example. Below is another system of components. Uh, a signal will be sent from one end of the system and will be successfully transmitted to the other end if no intermediate components fail. Uh, basically the same setup as the previous problem, except I'm going to have a different setup for the components. So again, we have an upper row and a lower row. In the upper row, we're going to have the component that I'm going to call A. Uh, but it then splits off into uh, two, a system consisting of two subcomponents. We have uh, B1 and B2. And, uh, and uh, B1. So that's going to be the upper row. And for the lower row, we're just going to have a simple... Uh, setup where we have C1 and C2. Okay, and let's fill it in with probabilities. So the probability of A is 0.7. The probability of B is, or B1 is 0.8. The probability of B2 is 0.9. Uh, the probability of C1 is 0.8, and the probability of C2 is 0.9. And again, we're assuming that all of these components are mutually independent of each other. Uh, so now let's think a little bit more carefully about uh, what oops yeah what transmission means here. So the transmission event uh, let's start tracking uh, paths through uh, let's start tracking the uh, paths that our signal could possibly take. Uh, we could have this blue path where uh, it goes through A and then it goes through B1. Or we could have the green path where it goes through A and then B2. Or we could have the red path where it goes through the lower row uh, through C1 and C2. Okay, so uh, those are basically the possibilities for successful transmission. So we've got uh, writing this as a compound event. This is going to be A and B1, so we can trace a path through uh, via the components A and B1. Or we could have uh, trace our a path between A and B2. Or we can trace our path through the lower row, C1 and C2. And uh, maybe we can simplify our lives a little bit if we gave these uh, the names um, D, uh, so events D. E and F and work with those events instead. Okay, so then the probability of transmission oops, I don't want pink for this. Alright, so the probability of transmission will be the probability of the event D or E or F. which is going to be, according to uh, one of the formulas that we have from section two, the probability of D plus the probability of E plus the probability of F minus the probability of D and E minus the probability of D and F Uh, minus the probability of E and F plus the probability of D and E and F. Okay, so we're going to need the probability of the events D, E, and F. So the probability of the event D, because it consists of independent events, is going to be the product of those events' individual probabilities. So that's going to be the probability of A1 multiplied with the probability of B1, uh, no, not A1, just A, but the probability of A multiplied with the probability of B1, which is going to be um, 0.7 times 0.8. So 0.7 times 
which is equal to 0.56. The probability of the event E is going to be the probability of the events A and B2, which is equal to uh, 0.7 times 0.9. And the probability of the event F, that's going to be the product of the probabilities of the events C1 and C2, which is going to be uh, 0.8 times 0.9. So uh, this is all getting uh, rather complicated. Uh, like it's getting really hard to read this stuff. So let's uh, clean this up a little bit. Uh, we've got uh, we got in the end uh, 0.56 uh, probability of E after the multiplication is 0.63 and the probability of F in the end after you do that multiplication is going to be uh, 0.72 okay uh, so uh, that means down here the probability transmission will be um, we've got 0.56 plus 0 0.72 plus 0 0.72 minus the probability of D and E but D and E since they are consisting themselves of mutually independent ev events are also mutually independent so this is going to be uh, 0.56 times 0 0.72, uh, 0.63 minus, similarly for D and F, you'll have 0.56 times 0.72. And similarly for E and F, you'll get uh, minus 0.63 times 0.72. And then for the probability of D and E and F, since these are all mutually independent events, uh, this is going to be uh, 0.56 times 0.63 times 0.72. All right, you take that to your calculator, and in the end, the resulting probability will be 0 0.91208. Okay, that's it. And that's it for this section, too. So... Um, in the next section, we're going to start talking about discrete random variables. This is the first time that we're going to start talking about random variables. Uh, we're going to, like this section both serves as an introduction to random variables in general and also in particular to discrete random variables. And once you start talking about random variables, things start to get even more interesting because as much fun as probably was, um, it's really in the random variables where probably uh, where probably really starts to take off. So uh, I look forward to chapter three and uh, discussing it with you guys. So uh, that's it for chapter two. Uh, thank you for watching and I will see you later.